Eyewitness News presents Newsmakers with your hosts, Jane Ann Bugda and Andy Mahalshek. Hello and welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Andy Mahalshek. And I'm Jane Ann Bugda. Today we are getting a unique snapshot of our region, courtesy of the research of the Institute of Public Policy and Economic Development. And they provide interesting data on wages, the job outlook, and some of the challenges that our area faces in hopes of making a positive change. We'll introduce you to our guest, and our conversation begins when this edition of Newsmakers returns right after this. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Jane Ann Bugda along with Andy Mahalsik. And we have an interesting program for you today because we are talking about our region, talking about the different um, aspects of our region. And it all comes courtesy through research through the Institute. You know, we talk about the power of information, mm -hmm. the power of numbers. You know, and folks, we're all talking about uh, logistics and data and analysis in a real time basis. Well, these folks are experts at it for years and years before it was on our radars, quite frankly. Uh, and Terry and Jill is here today for the Institute. You know, and just basically describe what is your Institute all about and what's its main goal? Well, our main goal is to focus on data analysis and solutions. Uh, our job is to get the data, to interpret the data so that people understand what it means and how it can be used in decision making, whether you're in the public sector, the private sector, or the nonprofit sector. So uh, we focus on two tracks of research, one that we call community-based, which we get out for public consumption, our annual indicators, which we'll talk about, as well as an economy tracker, a policy tracker, and all sorts of subject matter research. And then the other track is specifically for clients that have specific research that they want done, whether it's surveys or strategic plans or needs assessments, economic impact studies, those types of things. And when we talk about the Institute, and it, it was the Institute of Public Policy and Economic Development, but for our purposes and for your legal purposes, it's now just the Institute, correct? Yes. yes. So who makes up the Institute? Who are the people that we are talking about? Who are the people that are doing the research? Well, we are a partnership, actually, of 13 colleges and universities mm -hmm. in Lackawanna and Luzerne counties. And that includes our four-year public and private schools, and it also includes Luzerne County Community College, the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, Johnson College, and the Wright Center for Graduate Medical Education. And so they really guide. Um, they are robust supporters, and they help us. Um, we're a small team internally, um, but they really help us um, maintain all of the resources that we need to produce our research. A lot of brain power, a lot of smart <laughs> people. You're yes. hearing all these universities, and I think you know, over the years, we we take for granted, I think, or some do, the power of our local higher education and mm -hmm. the people who run those schools and the students in there. So you're able to work with those folks and tap into that, correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, higher education infrastructure in the region is truly uh, an asset in so many ways. It, it, economic asset in terms of just generating economic impact throughout the region, major employers, but the brain power between the students and the faculty um, are, are very important. And we, um, we do most of our work with the students. Uh, we provide mentoring to the medical school students and the residents at the Wright Center, as well as uh, research practicums to students from all the other schools. So they work alongside our research team in collecting data, analyzing data, and writing reports and get to understand what you said, Andy, the power of data in decision making. And, you know, we're very fortunate to have you here because you're getting ready to present a new report. So we're giving everybody sort of a little sneak peek of what, what's in this year's report. So based on the data, what are some of the biggest challenges our region is facing? Well, we have a few challenges, um, and you know that's what people focus on is the negative side. Uh, but in this year's report, we're going to be talking about how we have challenges just like most other communities, regions, and even states across the country. We're not much different. One, there's a workforce issue. Uh, right now, there's more jobs than people. Uh, and it's primarily because we're, we're losing people as they go into retirement, that baby boomer generation is exiting the workforce and by sheer numbers the the work workers the younger workers coming up behind them there's just not as many so that that leads to a worker shortage um, so for the first time ever northeastern pennsylvania has a really competitive unemployment rate uh, but it is also competing for talent 
with every other community around the country that's experiencing this same kind of shortage. So um, it, it's, it's an issue we need to keep track of, not just in terms of numbers, but ensuring that we don't have a structural mismatch, meaning that the types of jobs um, and the skills and education of the workforce are symbiotic and, and not counterproductive. Um, we also have a housing issue in the region that's pretty significant. When you think of the fact that over 50% of the houses in northeastern Pennsylvania were built before 1950, we have not had a lot of new development. And um, we've had some population growth, uh, which is one factor. Um, and with that old of a housing stock, a lot of housing is falling into blight and disrepair and no longer usable, and it's created a housing shortage. And so with that, it's principles of economics, supply and demand, and when that supply is tight, the price goes up. And that's a challenge for many working people is to be able to afford the median price house and the median rent these days. And, and, the, and the housing, of course, how much of a deterrence, if you know, how much of a deterrence is the housing issue or, or problems keeping people from moving here for these jobs or staying here? Is it, uh, it's gotta be like two double-edged sword here, right? It is, and while we don't have data to support that, you can make some anecdotal argument, the fact that if you're trying to grow your population and pe bring people in um, to work in the jobs that are available, you gotta have places for them to live. And without having adequate housing at different price points, um, it's problematic. So, you know, what are some of our assets and some of our great opportunities here in our region? Actually, Terry mentioned a few of them as um, she was discussing challenges because they're all so intertwined. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have we have assets in terms of our the Eds and Med structure, which is our robust, really uh, rich medical education community. We have <coughs> the growing population that Terry mentioned, and a lot of other areas in the country can't say the same. Um, there's there's not so many who are. Um, talking about population increases, but there's an influx of people from a diverse range of races and ethnicities. Um, we have people coming in from larger cities, and with that, they are bringing new ideas, they're bringing entrepreneurism, they're bringing um, different perspectives. So it's a lot of um, really great perspectives if we are um, going to embrace them. So. I hate to bring up mm -hmm. the word COVID again. Are we still, and we're all haunted by it one way or another, or at least it, it's, it's, it has changed our society in so many ways. Are we still seeing the impact of COVID uh, in our region as far as the economy, assets or, or debits? I mean, are we still seeing that, uh, Terry? Uh, to Bill? some degree, mm -hmm. yes, in, in some areas. But I think if you want to talk about it economically, I think we're coming out of it. When we look at this year's data, you know, we see things like job creation, like um, the GDP going up for the region, increases in exports. Are we where we were pre-COVID? No, not necessarily. But that there is that continued improvement in those areas. Um, and some of the things that I talked about with regard to workforce and housing, um, while there were challenges for, before COVID, COVID exacerbated the situation. So that means now we've got a little bit more trouble in those areas than we would have had if it, if it weren't for COVID. Um, but, but they were challenges rising to the surface anyway. So when you talk about COVID, you think by this time, you know, we should be seeing, but you, let me just ask you this, as both of you are looking at the studies, you think, and you, say, you think it's something that's gonna be lingering for a little bit through a couple yeah. more studies that you think that it might be it's uh, making an time. impact? Yeah, I think, we're, I think we're especially going to see it in terms of children. Mm -hmm. uh, children that lost the opportunity to socialize and develop emotionally and socially by being home. Uh, and, and I think at that age it affected academic performance because they're, they're not as adept as being an adult or even a teenager, if you will, at, at being able to interact well on the computer to learn, you know, to communicate, to play games maybe, but to actually get academic lessons. It was new for everybody. It was new for teachers. It was a struggle to, to get online. So I think we're going to see some deficiencies over the next couple of years as we try and get the younger age groups up to speed. Um, COVID also exacerbated mental health issues. Um, 
I think before COVID, we didn't talk about about it. It was it was a growing issue um, all over the country, all over the world, uh, but still a stigma. People didn't talk about it. It was embarrassing, and frankly, we were short on re resources. Well, COVID um, made it much worse for many people, and it brought to light the fact that we really, as a society, don't have all of the resources in place we need to deal with the volume and uh, of individuals suffering from mental health issues. Uh, and you also did a, a living wage study, which I find this very, this was very interesting. Tell us about this. Uh, what, tell us about this study, a living wage study. Mm -hmm. Uh, we complete the living wage study. We've done a couple updates now, but we do that in partnership with the University of Scranton, and that is intended to draw attention to the so-called working poor. And these are people who are working hard but still struggle to maintain um, a modest yet dignified living is how we describe it. So they're trying to determine which utility bill they're going to pay this week and how they're going to find affordable child care and how they're going to get to work. Um, and all of those things come at not only a personal cost, but costs to families and households, broader communities, and then to the economy overall. So that uh, research really is intended to bring people's attention to what is essential in terms of a livable income, mm -hmm. and it's especially for um, different types of household compositions, different familial structures. And we're talking about really, they say, dinner table issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if families even get together anymore because mm -hmm. everyone's trying to work a couple jobs, this and that. And exactly. We have, we're so busy. One person said to me last couple, I did a story about the fast paced society. It's always been fast paced, but mm -hmm. now it's like get it done yesterday, mm -hmm. you know, or just move on. We're talking with uh, Terry Ohms, uh, President and CEO of the Institute, and Jill Avery Stoss, COO and Chief Operating Officer of the Institute, talking about the numbers and their big, and this is a must read. Now, you'll be able to get it online, and also, uh, it's called the Indicators Report, and there's everything in here talked about, every, every aspect of our community, and I just want to give that a plug, and your, your big event's coming up May 3rd. Just uh, recap that, what's coming up on May 3rd? Uh, May 3rd is when we present the data, the report, to the community um, and we also present our subject matter research and, and we, we do research in housing and health and the economy and infrastructure and things like that and it's driven by collaboration among individuals who volunteer to be on those subject matter task forces. Uh, they vet the research, they help us deploy the research and ensure that it gets in the hands of the community. So May 3rd, we have a live event at the Woodlands at 8.30 and a virtual event uh, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Am I correct in saying this book isn't, the research isn't done and they're put on a shelf somewhere and it collects dust? This is a living, breathing mm -hmm. organism. Yes. Constantly. It's exciting because we love to hear stories about how people use the data and, and we hear constantly from organizations that use it to help write grants, to measure whether or not their programs are successful. Local governments like the data because it helps them keep track of what's happening in their communities, getting a better understanding of the communities. So there's really a number of applications that can be used. Now you mentioned task force. Tell us about your task force. What are they studying? We actually have about seven task forces, and each of those task forces are comprised of um, community stakeholders with some degree of subject matter expertise that aligns with the focus of each task force. So for example, uh, we have a housing task force, and there are some real estate professionals on that task force. Um, our health and health care task force, um, we have participation from um, medical professionals and health care providers. Our utility, or I'm sorry, energy task force has representatives from our local utility companies. So um, each of those task forces brings unique um, subject matter experts and they also help us um, hone in on our research areas. And I know you were saying about the, these task forces, and they actually help our, our community leaders in their planning. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I know we had some success stories in the past, but tell us now when, when people look at this, when a community leader comes in and looks at what you have set up, what kind of projects go from that? 
Well, really, it can be nearly anything. I mean, if, if you're in county government and you want to understand what's happening in your county and the social services sectors are related to crime and things like that, all of that data is in there. So it can help determine where where you need to deploy more funds, where, where you can maybe ease up a little bit, what, what's the true nature of, of the problems that are happening in communities. Um, a lot of the major foundations in the area, the community foundations and the family foundations, use the data there to really help focus their philanthropy better. Mm -hmm. So they, they know where the, the money will do the most good in addressing community problems. You know, we talk about, there's been a lot of talk in recent years on ARPA funds. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, does that, uh, those funds impact your institute at all? Or what are you seeing those ARPA funds having impact in our region, whether it be in our communities or counties, individuals? What are you seeing, if, if you know that? Well, we, we are familiar with what some of the communities are doing with their ARPA funds. Um, it's really a game changer for, for um, the counties and, and, and the cities and smaller communities because it can help fill in their wish list of things that they know they need to do, they want to do, but there, there was never a funding source for. So we know communities that are, are using it for infrastructure improvements or to improve broadband access. Other communities um, are using it for economic development purposes. Some are using it to fill the missions of nonprofit organizations that are supporting different stakeholders in the community with different issues. Um, but like I said, it's it's new. It, it's not tied to tax revenue. It doesn't have to be allocated in a certain way like much of the tax revenue does. So it really gives an opportunity for communities to focus on where their needs are. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And the information that you're seeing on today's show can be seen on pahomepage.com under the Newsmakers link. And you can check out their, we have a link to their Facebook page and their web page. And you can see little, uh, little, little vignettes of some of the people telling about the task force. Very interesting. So you are watching Newsmakers, and we are a proud recipient of three Pennsylvania Association of Broadcasting Awards for Excellence in Public Affairs Programming and a Keystone State Award for Best Not Talk Show in the State. And we'll be back right after this. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Jane Ann Bugged along with Andy Mahal. Took a very interesting conversation going on. We're talking with our friends here from the Institute, Terry Holmes, who's the president and CEO, and Jill Avery Stoss, who's the chief operating officer of the Institute. And um, we're learning a little insight about our, our region. They have an upcoming event uh, on May 3rd. We'll have that information up on the screen. But I know every uh, year you poll college students. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, we actually poll them twice per year, um, and we poll the students at our 13 um, partnering institutions. And we ask them about things like civic engagement, um, their interest in policy issues, their perceptions of Northeastern Pennsylvania, and their plans for um, post-graduation. And some of the broader trends, some of the things we've learned over the years is that they are very engaged and interested in current events. They're concerned about issues uh, such as the cost of education and um, the environment. When it comes to their perceptions of the region, um, for a long time we had been hearing from them that um, they're interested in relocating elsewhere because there aren't enough jobs in the area or the jobs that are available don't quite offer substantial wages. Um, and now we know, of course, that there, there is, in fact, a workforce shortage, and there are jobs available, not just in warehousing and logistics, but um, in a number of industries. And those wages are starting to creep up. So we're hoping to, to see those perceptions evolve in the f future. Yeah. It's an incredible opportunity, really, mm -hmm. when you think about it, because students are coming here from all over the world to go to our first-class institutions. And um, I think we've missed the boat in the past in not making sure they understand who Northeastern Pennsylvania is. You know, they see a snippet of it from their perspective mm -hmm. from the classroom, and maybe they have a part-time job, or maybe they walk to a coffee shop or whatever, um, but they really don't have the full background um, on what's happening 
in the region and I think it's exciting. I think one of the things that we've always been bad about in the region is is really bashing ourselves. Right. Uh, there's nothing to do here. Oh, it's boring here, blah, 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 blah. And that's the perception that gets out there. That's the image we've created of the region. We're our own worst enemy. But when you think about it, what Jill was saying, there are incredible job opportunities for people of all different education and skill levels. Wages have gone up. The recreation and amenities around here are, are really phenomenal. I mean, there's 12 months of whatever you want to do, wherever you want to do it kind of thing going on. Um, we, we do have some faults, but uh, there's no perfect community mm -hmm. out there. But I think we need to do a better job of focusing on what's good here. Um, and I, I think that will surpass what's bad and help us bring our own image into a higher profile. We, I mean, we have a captive audience with all these tens of thousands of students and their family mm -hmm. comes in and their mm -hmm. sporting events. And I've always thought, again, from covering this area and living here, being born and raised here and covering it for all these years, I, I often thought we shot ourselves in the foot too many times. Mm -hmm. Again, there's no utopia out there, but we have a lot of great things. Quick story, somebody just moved to the area, won't say who, and uh, they heard all the negative stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a very educated, it's a, I want to say high-ranking position, and they love it. They can't believe all the events of the skiing and the boating and the entertainment mm -hmm. and the arena, just to mention a few. I mean, uh, it just, again, are we our, our, are we our own worst enemy, Terry? I mean, uh, yes, wholeheartedly agreed. I think we often overlook what's in our backyard. Um, people will say, well, we'll go to New York because there's so much to see and do there in the city. And sure there is, but there kind of is here too. And that's some of the exciting stuff that Jill had talked about with the, the diversity, the cultural diversity. You see now that there's more different kinds of international food fairs and festivals and uh, s small businesses opening up all over Scranton and Wilkesbury and Hazleton owned by individuals from all these different countries who are bringing cuisine and gifts and things like that here. So we are vibrant, we are diverse, and that's what people want to leave the area to go mm -hmm, to, right. but it is it's really, here. it's right here. We just have to kind of take notice. There's some imperfections, of course, you know, we could have a little more green, where, you know, buildings could be in a little more repair, less cracked sidewalks and potholes, but, you know, the, those, those are the things that can be fixed. The infrastructure of, of all of the things we're talking about is here and it's strong. So say there's a community leader watching or a nonprofit and they say, you know, we like some, a closer look at something. So how do they go about that? How do they approach you to say, hey, can you do a study on this for us? Well, one of the ways is through that task force network we talked about. Um, uh, we're, we're up to seven issue-based task forces now. Uh, we really would like to, to grow and have one that's linked to every single chapter in the book. Um, but people can volunteer and participate on a task force. It's a couple meetings a year. Uh, and, and that's where they bring ideas to the table to vet about how, how do we approach our community-based research. Um, if, if, if it's something proprietary for an organization to advance an organization or their mission, that's a little bit slightly different and that's a one-on-one -on -one conversation and that kind of a thing that takes place. It's really one-on-one -on -one metrics conversation, mm -hmm. right? I mm -hmm. mean, and I see in our own digital team here at Eyewitness News, we're watching response from people to stories or things we post or stories we've done in real time. And that's what you have been specializing in for years and years. So. You guys are uh, uh, the experts on this kind of stuff. We've been around since 2004. Um, <laughs> so we do have a, a lot of data at our fingertips. It's, it's not just da data we generate through our research in the community, but we use um, all of the federal and state uh, databases and data collection. Um, you know, it's a challenge. Some of that data is a little bit more dated. We are working on trying to increase our capacity to have more real-time data and more granular data, you know, so we can say what's happening in a particular zip code. What, you know, what are the issues there that we need to move forward in advance? So hopefully we'll be getting there in the next few years. And I know we touched upon this a little bit, but what are some of your success stories? We have a few minutes left, but that the, because of the Institute, they have uh, put something into, got the wheels in motion. Mm -hmm. Well, we've, we've had a few things that have worked in our favor. Um, we, a lot of our research served as a basis to expand some bus service in Luzerne County to some of our business parks. Um, there's a, a night route um, that, that occurs uh, 
We've, we, um, some of our earlier research was actually responsible for the land banking legislation that came into Pennsylvania uh, as a result of, of our work and funding of the public, state public housing trust fund. Uh, we've had some stuff in healthcare with regard to changes in legal issues with regard to hospice care and medicine um, that, that proved positive as a way to get some opioids off the street and things like that. And once again, we want to mention the upcoming uh, re indicators report. Uh, again, May 3rd, mm -hmm. and there's still time to sign up. Uh, we have the information on your screen, but we also have it on pahomepage.com. Right. And, and it's interesting, it's, it's open to everyone. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in learning about our region, this is an excellent way to find out. So a company moving in or a company that's already here doesn't have to say, we have to hire a researcher, we have to hire a team to do this. The date is already here, am I correct? Yes. Yes, come to our website, uh, learn about us from, from that data. It's balanced, it shows everything, and um, it'll help you make more informed decisions. When does the next study begin? <laughs> I always <laughs> ask this because <laughs> I already know. <laughs> They're always ongoing. <laughs> so so you're, the wheels are already in motion right. for yep. next year. Yep. So uh, Terry and Jill, thank you so much because you offer a very unique insight to our region, and um, we invite people to uh, check out uh, our website which we have links to your website mm -hmm. and your Facebook pages where you, you'll have a great uh, deal of more information there so mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us today thank, thank you, you both thank you. for Andy Mahalshik and everyone behind the scenes I'm Jane Ambugda thank you so much for making newsmakers mm -hmm. part of your day and we'll talk again next time <laughs>